Okay, so in this video, I'm hoping to show you the importance of using a chi-square or goodness of fit test on um, analyzing basically uh, genetics like problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. Uh, the chi-square is actually this symbol. Um, and so when you see that like slanted X with the two, that is the chi-squared or goodness of fit test. Um, so we are going to um, uh, use a formula to calculate this chi-square. And so with that, uh, we're going to sum uh, basically our observed and our expected values um, after we've like taken observed minus expected squared over the expected. So uh, before though we can actually like really understand chi-squared, let's get comfortable with finding our observed and our expected values, and then we'll plug in the numbers and then we'll see what to do with the chi-square value. So uh, let's use this really easy example of some giraffe from one of my ratio videos. Uh, so let's say you have 37 tall giraffe and 43 short. So we actually are given our observed, 37 and 43. So now it's up to us to calculate the expected. And that can be the tricky part for students sometimes is figuring out, well, what should have happened, I guess. Uh, so here, um, we need to think about what gene or genotypes of parent giraffes would like result in approximately a one-to-one -one ratio of tall to short offspring. So hopefully you've done enough Punnett squares in your life to, to think, oh, that must be a heterozygote crossed with a homozygous recessive. And so once we know that, then we can see that the expected should be about 50% tall and 50% short. It should be a one-to-one -one ratio. So uh, now to calculate... Oh, so now to uh, calculate that expected, we need to add up our observed. We have 80 a giraffe, and so we would expect 40 or 50% to be tall and 50% to be short. Okay, but what do we do with that observed and that expected, right? So let's see how we can plug it in to the chi-squared formula. So uh, we have uh, two phenotypes we're really looking at. So we have tall and short. So our first one, we have the tall phenotype. Our observed is 37 minus the 40 that we expected squared divided by 40. But we also have the short phenotype. So here you have your 43 short minus the 40 we expected um, squared divided by 40. Um, divided by your expected, right? So here uh, we end up finding that our chi-squared value when we add these together is actually 0.46. But what do we do with that? What does that even matter? So let's go ahead and use um, the, uh, go back to the, the giraffes. So let's say that the scientists are hypothesizing that tall height in giraffes is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. So we wanna know, um, do our, or does our observed values um, match this pattern of inheritance? Uh, if we actually are saying tall height is inherited as autosomal dominant and the cross was a heterozygous a giraffe crossed with a homozygous re recessive, then we would expect 50-50. Did what we observe closely match that well enough to say, yeah, we can confirm that a tall height is a dominant trait, uh, autosomally. So um, there's something new, at least for my students, that we haven't seen yet this year. It's called the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no difference. So here, the no difference part is that slight variation that we're seeing between our observed and our expected isn't statistically significant, meaning that statistically speaking, there is no difference between what we observed and what we expected, that it's close enough to say, yes, uh, this trait, our tall height is inherited as a dominant autosomal trait. Uh, another example would be if you had a quarter and you flipped it 100 times, you would expect 50 heads and 50 tails, but you might get like 48 and 52. Now, the null hypothesis would say if, if we, um, if the null hypothesis were like true, it would be that 48 and 52 is acceptable. It's close enough to the 50-50 um, expected. Now, if you flipped a quarter 100 times though and you got 20 heads and 80 tails, 
Oh, we might be rejecting the null hypothesis that that variation 20 and 80 is too far away from 50-50. There might be something fishy going on with that quarter. Maybe it's a trick coin that gamblers use, right? So the null hypothesis in that example of 20 and 80 would be rejected, uh, that that variation is not due to chance. Okay, so here, just looking at um, our data, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, 37 is close to 40, 43 is close to 40. That is uh, just due to chance, the slight uh, numbers, that variation we're seeing. But um, if we had data that like this, 63 tall and 17 short, um, could we really say that that variation is just due to chance? Probably not, right? Like, oh no, maybe height in giraffes is not due to an autosomal dominant trait. Maybe it's due to diet. Maybe it's that environment influencing height. So the important thing to remember though, as a scientist is your opinion doesn't matter. So you can't look at this data and just have your opinion be like, oh yeah, no, it's uh, we're gonna reject the null. The variation is too great. No, we need to do a statistical analysis. We need like data, we need scientific or mathematical evidence that shows that variation is too great. We're gonna reject the null hypothesis. It's not due to an autosomal dominant trait. So the whole point of this statistical test is to remove like the scientist's opinion basically and have statistical mathematical evidence to accept or reject um, a hypothesis. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, see. So let's go ahead and look at, we did our first um, chi-squared value, right? We did it at 0.46 with that um, observed and expected data. But if we use that new table and we fill in uh, those new observed values, we get a totally different chi-square uh, calculation. So now here, uh, if you've been daydreaming while watching this video, this is the time to focus. I'm going to introduce a lot of vocabulary on this slide. Okay, so we have this table called a chi-squared table. And uh, there's some things in the table, right? We see degrees of freedom, and we see p-value, and we see a lot of numbers. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate our degrees of freedom. And as you can see in the chi-square calculations that we did, we had two events or two phenotypes. We had the tall and the short. So we had two things we added together. So to calculate our degrees of freedom, I would be two minus one. So for our problem here, our degrees, degrees of freedom is one. So it's always however many things you added together minus one. So if I added three things, my degrees of freedom would be two. All right, uh, now the next, uh, point of interest is this p-value. Now, the p-value is your significance level or your significant value. Um, and in statistics, your p-value is like how confident you are. So a p-value of 0.05 is saying that you are 95% confident in the statement you are making. A p-value of 0.01 is even stronger. That's saying 99, with 99% confidence. But generally speaking, a 0.05 p-value is what we're going to use. So when in doubt, use a 0.05 p-value if the question doesn't uh, tell you what to use. Okay, so now uh, we have our p-value of 0.05 and we have our degrees of freedom of 1. Now, wherever these two numbers cross in that table, that is how we find our critical value. So for our problem here, our critical value is 3.84. Okay, so we have our critical value. Now we get to see what we're gonna do with it. So um, we're gonna compare our chi-squared to that 3.84. So uh, our null hypothesis earlier was that um, uh, giraffe height is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait, and any variation we're seeing between our observed and our expected was purely due to chance. So now I'm gonna take my chi-squared of point, uh, oh, if your chi-squared value falls below your critical value, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, which in statistics, um, we do not say accept the null. So on an earlier slide, a few minutes ago, I said, oh, we can accept, and in my mind, I was like, no. Um, 
So basically, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which kind of means we're accepting it, that the null hypothesis is correct, but we don't phrase it that way. Okay, so if our, if our chi-squared value is less um, than our critical value, uh, you basically fail to reject the null. But if it's greater than the null of the, if your chi-squared is greater than the critical value, then you are uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. So for example, that 0.46 we calculated is below 3.84. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, basically saying that yes, tall is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait in giraffe. And that slight variation we're seeing of 37 to 40 uh, and 43 compared to 40 is just due to chance. And that slight variation is acceptable within the realm of um, autosomal dominant and recessive traits. Now, if you look at the second uh, example we used, we had a very large chi-squared value, 26.45. Now, what that means is, oh no, tall height is not inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. Our numbers, were the variation was way too great. We're gonna reject that null hypothesis. There must be something else influencing giraffe height. Maybe it's the environment and nutrition levels or something, okay. So uh, I have two more examples for us. Um, so let's go ahead and see about a student who is in charge of taking care of her chickens at home. She takes what she learns in her genetics unit and begins to breed her chickens while keeping track of their phenotypes. She crosses a pure breeding black Andalusian chicken uh, with a pure breeding white Andalusian chicken. Okay, so there's our parental uh, cross, our parental generation. Um, she notices that all of the F1 um, have this grayish phenotype. She allows the F1 generation to mate and produce an F2 generation. Okay, so she, looking at that F2, she suspects that feather color is inherited as an incompletely dominant trait. And she decides to perform a chi-squared goodness of fifth test to see, does um, her data match incomplete dominance? So um, here in a parental cross, we had uh, like a black purebred true breeding homozygous uh, chicken crossed with a white purebred true breeding uh, homozygous chicken. And all of their heterozygotes were gray. Okay, okay. Then she allowed these gray heterozygotes to cross. And it turns out that in her, oops, in her offspring of the F2, you had some that were uh, black phenotype. Some had gray phenotype and some had a white phenotype. Okay, okay. So if we look at the data, what we would see here, uh, she has 16 black in the F2, 43 gray and 21 white. So now our job though is to calculate that expected. And what we see, oops, I kind of wanted to write on this. So out of the four possibilities inside the F2 Punnett square, we can see one, there's a one out of four chance that the um, offspring of the chicken is gonna have black uh, feathers. So about a 25% chance. Two out of the four uh, will have gray, so about a 50% chance. And then one out of four will have white feathers, about a 25% chance. So now we know the percentages of what should happen. So let's actually calculate that expected. So our next step would be, okay, our total is 80 chickens. Uh, and so that would be, we expect about 20 to have black feathers, 40 to have gray, and about 20 to have white. Okay, so now we're going to take this data and we're going to do a chi-square goodness of fit test to see does the data match incomplete dominance as the pattern of inheritance for feather color. Okay, so I have my, sorry, my screen recording is cutting things off a little, I'm sorry. So the chi-squared Earlier in giraffes, we only had two things we added. Here we're going to have three. We have our black feather phenotype, we have our gray feather phenotype, and our white feather phenotype. So when we calculate these numbers, we get a chi-squared value of 1.08. So now let's remember about our degrees of freedom. So here we added three things together, and the degrees of freedom is 3 minus 1 here in this example. So our degrees of freedom is gonna be two. Now our p-value, we'll use 0.05. So if we go to our two degrees of freedom and our p-value of 0.05, 
we have a new critical value in this question. Our critical value this time is 5.99. So remember, our critical value is what we use uh, to compare our chi-square calculation to. So if our chi-square is less than 5.99, it's less than our critical value, that would mean we fail to reject our null hypothesis. If it's greater than 5.99, then we reject our null. Okay, so 1.08 actually falls under our critical value, so we are going to fail to reject our null hypothesis, which basically what we're saying is the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. The feather color in these Andalusian chickens is inherited as incompletely dominant. The observed uh, values that we saw were close enough to what we expected to happen to say with 95% certainty, yes, this is an incompletely dominant uh, trait. Okay, so now I have one more question for us. So let's take some dogs. <laughs> I made this up, so ignore my um, whatever these are, uh, pictures. So scientists studying two different traits in dogs suspect they may be inherited on different autosomal chromosomes. So what they're saying is that like fur color and ear shape are inherited on separate chromosomes in dogs. So they're going to take a floppy eared, a heterozygous floppy eared dark brown fur dog. Um, and uh, oh, so here's a null hypothesis. Uh, fur color and ear shape are inherited on different autosomal chromosomes is what our hypothesis is. So this uh, heterozygous dog, a dihybrid dog for both traits, is test crossed to a homozygous recessive dog. Complete the chi-square goodness of fit test. So, okay, so here's our cross. We have that dihybrid dog heterozygous for both traits and a dog who's homozygous recessive for both. So um, the first dog that... Uh, right there, these four letter, groups of letters, I don't know, represent uh, the possible gametes if these traits are inherited on different chromosomes based on Mendel's law of independent assortment. Now, the other uh, homozygous recessive dog, all of its gametes will be um, recessive for both traits. Those are the only alleles it has to, to give. So then you can fill in a Punnett square. All right, all right. So we have our observed already listed. So now let's go ahead and calculate um, our expected. So 25% of the dogs uh, would be expected to be brown fur and floppy ears, 25% brown fur and pointed ears, 25% spotted fur and floppy ears, and then 25% spotted fur and pointed ears. So you'd expect a one out of four, one out of four, one out of four, one out of four chance of these phenotypes showing up in the offspring. So when we look at this, though, we find out of the 56 puppies uh, like produced over generations, it wasn't one litter, um, we would expect there to be 14. One fourth of 56 is 14, 14, 14, 14. Wow, our observed is quite different, though. So you could stop here and be like, oh, yeah, uh, we're going to reject the null. But again, that's your opinion, and we need statistical analysis and data to support that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our chi-squared and uh, this time we have four things to add, right? So we have the brown fur and floppy ears. We have the brown fur and pointed ears. We have the spotted and floppy, and then we have the spotted fur and pointed ears. So we have four different uh, phenotypes we're looking for. And once you calculate those, um, let's see, my face is right there. Uh, you find that your chi-squared is actually 25.86, a very large number. All right, so in this example, our degrees of freedom is three. So if we use our chi-squared table, degrees of freedom of three, and our p-value of 0.05, we find our new critical value is 7.82. Okay, okay. So again, if it goes, if our chi-squared value falls below this critical value, then we know we can fail to reject and the two traits would be inherited on uh, different chromosomes. Now, uh, if it's above though, we're going to reject that null hypothesis. And yeah, as you can tell already, it is a very large number. We're going to reject these two traits are not inherited um, on different chromosomes. And so now, uh, 
as a scientist, they'd be wondering what the heck, right? And so um, I think this is the end of my PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, if it depends where you are in your genetics class. Oh, no, I have my data down there. So if you look at the data, though, let me just put this in your ear. Uh, down at the bottom of my PowerPoint, you can see uh, these numbers in the middle are very different. Um, that's a sign that maybe these traits are actually linked and inherited together on the same chromosomes. And those two in the center are probably due to uh, the results of crossing over. So I'll have a whole separate video on linked genes, but I kind of wanted to put that little bug in your ear that when you see numbers that don't really match what you expected, that means that uh, they're not following Mendel's laws and something else is going on. Could be that they're linked. Okay. All right. Good job.